Hello. Welcome to this edition of ICANN on AI Enlightenment Series geared towards empowering our public with knowledge for cutting edge service delivery. Since 2003, it has been established that governments depend on the trust of their citizens and their national and international stakeholders in order to deliver their goals efficiently and effectively. The regular publication of high quality accrual based financial reports helps to strengthen public financial management and is a fundamental ingredient in maintaining that trust. The International Public Sector Accounting Standards, what we say, IPSAS. The IPAS based information provides a comprehensive and comparable picture of a public sector entity's financial performance and position. IPSAS, IPSAS adoption and implementation, therefore, represent fundamental steps for governments to take, not only to increase transparency and accountability to their citizens and stakeholders, but also to inform effective decision making. So contributing to fiscal stability and sustainability. Joining me to throw in that insights to accrual based IPSAS as a tool of public governance, uh, looking at the Nigerian experience thus far, what are the issues? What are the challenges? And what are the notable areas of implementation is Mr. Paul G. Oshaw, FCA, a professional accountant with in-depth knowledge and experience in information technology as it relates to business processes, as well as in IPSAS and IFRS change management and its enablement. Mr. Paul G. Oshaw, who is also a CMA, a CIS, CGMA, CISA, CISM and CISL professionals has established and proven competence. He has established and proven competence in human and technology requirements of converting ongoing and ongoing adoption of international financial reporting standards and its constituent partner uh, talking about IPSAS in the accounting and ensuring that this has been deployed in Kaduna and Aqua Ibom states. And of course, in numerous other private sector entities. We are going to be unveiling more on our guest in our guest interview segments very shortly, of course. Also, on this segment, we are going to be showing some tidbits about the Institute of Federal Council of Nigeria, our membership, and also information concerning how you could come on board and advertise your goods and services, which we assure you will get to the nooks and crannies of our globe. Please stay connected. We shall be back with you shortly.
welcome back and um, apologies for that situation. I have um, given so much about apology to oh, so you. Mr. Apology, so you are welcome to our final prayer. Thank you very much, Mr. Kukatsuke. We got to put on this subject. And just to set um, proper context for a conversation about international public sector accounting standards, yeah, which I'm sure um, I guess our listeners now know is FICTA. Looking at that in Nigeria, I suspect the whole game of this discussion generally in terms of overview, highlight. Please tell us the trajectory so far and where we are. We are right as a country. Okay, so thank you very much for the question. Um, if you recall, sometime in 2010, the Federal Executive Council um, approved for Nigeria to adopt IFRS and IPSAS. IFRS obviously for the private sector and the international public sector accounting standard, which is the subject matter for our conversation today for the public sector. So IFRS for private sector, IPSAS for public sector. Um, IFR, the private sector, as it were, was meant to adopt IFRS from year 2012 to 2014, whilst the public sector was meant to take the button from there from 2014 to 2016. Now, um, 2018 is another significant milestone that I would like to talk about. I, I hope in the course of the conversation, we'll, I will have opportunity to explain uh, the significance of 2018 in the IPSAS adoption trajectory. Hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, you just spoke about the uh, adoption of a 12 basic access and as someone who is currently providing advisory services to two state governments on IPSAS, what exactly does transition to acquire basic IPSAS entail? I mean, uh, what are the specific deliverables to convert from the legacy reporting standards to IPSAS? Okay, so that, that that's a very good question. Um, so when we talk about transition, it presupposes that the public sector entity had been rendering its financial reports under some form of architecture or framework prior to adoption of IPSAS. So, uh, speaking to your question, when you are transiting from the legacy reporting architecture to the international public sector accounting standard, you are essentially going through four portfolios of work streams, uh, which can be summarized into four major processes. Number one is what we call recognition. What is recognition? It means in your legacy reporting framework, there could probably, in the case of Nigeria, the answer is there will be. There will certainly have been certain assets that IPSA recognizes, but your old reporting framework will not have recognized. So these assets were not currently in the books at the time of adopting IPSA. So as you adopt IPSA, what do you do? You will recognize them. So I mean asset, it cuts across asset, it also cuts across spectrum of liability so the very first step is recognition now i i this is not to of course i'm simplifying it this is not to make it sound like it's an overnight endeavor that that point should be emphasized so the very first step out of the first step that i referred to is recognition of what assets and liabilities that you perhaps will not have recognized under the old reporting system. Then the second is what we call de-recognition. And I wish I could give examples as I go on. So what mm -hmm. are the type of assets? Um, maybe I should just give two. Number one would be property, plants, and equipment. Okay, so for mainstream public sector entity, under the uh, Finance Control and Management Act of 1958, um, Section 24, you are required to prepare consolidated financial statement, um, 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 capital development fund, um, um, statement of asset and liabilities, cash flow statement. Um, none of these reports will have encapsulated your property plans and equipment. So 
as you transit to Accra basis IPSAS, you will recognize them. The second is the recognition. The recognition presupposes you had recognized certain assets that are alienic to IPSAS, that are strange to IPSAS, okay? Assets and liabilities. So as you transit to Accra basis IPSAS, you will derecognize. Now, derecognition may sound like a vocabulary. What it means is you will expunge them from the books, okay? Making the first second step. The third step is what we call reclassification. This is essentially a format issue, okay? The way the financial reports will have been rendered prior to the adoption of the international public sector accounting standard may be different from IPSAS principles. So do some moving around here and there and ensure the format of financial statement reflects the sum and substance of IPSAS. Then the last is remeasurement. Remeasurement means you had actually recognized the liabilities and the asset, but the basis of measurement, in other words, the basis of valuation of those assets and liabilities are not in tandem with IPSA. So what do you do? You will remeasure. Now, at the risk of sounding repetitive, four steps, major work streams, actually, recognition, derecognition, reclassification, remeasurement. Excellent point. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Talk. That's it. That on. I then I understand that proper adoption of a cloud basis has, has technology dimension. This year we saw the need for enterprise resource planning, what we call ERP, um, ERP deployment, and I will want you to specifically address it in two parts. One, the difference between an ERP as represented by government integrated, which is the government integrated financial and information system, which is EIFMIS, and then of course the state integrated financial management information system, SIFMIS, as a basic accounting package, that is why. And the other aspect to that is that what is the place of the National Charge of Accounts? Or what we call MCOA in its past implementation. Okay, so thank you, thank you very very much for that thoughtful question. Um, let's begin with the SIFTAS, uh, no, not the SIFTAS, the SIFMIX and the GIFMIX that oh, yeah. you alluded to. So SIFMIX stands for State Integrated Financial Management Information System. Right. Okay, while GIFMIX stands for Government Integrated Financial Management Systems. Okay, right. so the GIFMIX uh, is associated with the Federal Government Initiative, while the SIFMIX is associ associated with state government subnational initiative. I mean, it's called many names by by many state governments. In fact, some call it BATMIS. Uh, Kaduna State Government call it BATMIS, for instance, budget and, and so on. Now, um, this SIFMIX and GIFMICs are meant to be ERPs. So what is an ERP? ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. Please take note of the word enterprise. enterprise. Okay. Um, so so let, let me take it from the known to perhaps the unknown. Many people listening to me will be conversant with um, solutions like uh, pitch trade. Um, maybe like um, QuickBooks. These are low-end accounting business solution that basically analyzes your transactions and generates your reports, okay? Now, so imagine a typical uh, Petri or Dakizi whose use is exclusive to the finance or accounts department. Now, imagine it on a broader scale on a more robust scale, such that there is a module for finance or what you call accounts, and there are many other modules for as many there are business division in the entire enterprise. Okay, so if you have a solution where the treasury, what you call the accountant general's office, has a module for its use, the, the uh, justice department or ministry as a module for his use. The Ministry of Works as a module for his use. And all these modules are assessing the same 
repository, the same consistent database. When you have that, you have what we call enterprise resource planning. What it means is the use of the solution is not limited to just a ministry or a division. The use cut across the whole enterprise. That's where the whole enterprise comes from. Okay, mm -hmm. so SIPMIX and GIFMIX are meant to mirror the capability of an ERP. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so you then ask, what is the place of the national chart of accounts? Mm -hmm. For most of us that have implemented solutions before, or you've participated in such implementation, you will have come to the realization that when you buy a solution, you will need what we call a chart of accounts that basically articulate, not articulate, that basically list all the codes. So you have a code for assets, you had the code for liability, you have many codes because you have many layers of asset with their relational database structure. You have many codes for liability, many codes for equity and all of that. Now, the code listing is what we call chart of accounts. So what then is the national chart of accounts? Now, a committee was put together, which was a subcommittee of Federation Account Allocation Committee, FAC, which was saddled with the responsibility of ensuring um, each, each free adoption of, of accrual basis in Nigeria. That committee structured a national chart of accounts, okay, for adoption by the federal, state, and local government so that you can, it can be used not just for treasury, it can also be used for budgeting. The national chart of accounts, as I close on that topic, the national chart of accounts has six segments, what we call in the order, what we call the administrative segment that contains 12 digits and the the economic segment that has eight digits the functional segment that has five digits the program segment that has 14 digits the fund segment that has another five digits and then the geolocation segment that has eight digits the aggregate of which results in 52 digits if well implemented you'll be able to drill down transactions to the what the word in which the revenue was generated or the expenses was incurred. Amazing. Thank you for that comprehensive coverage um, of the gift and the statement. Now, um, Mr. Also, what in your opinion are some of the structural hindrances to the adoption of a product to start to Nigeria? This question, in many ways, um, is, is very thoughtful. Um, you, you know, the public sector is a peculiar industry in Nigeria, and with certain authoritative documented policies and procedures that cut across the entire value chain or service chain. Uh, the, the, the point I'm making here is that some of these authoritative documents either do not acknowledge IPSAS or are in direct contradiction with accrual basis IPSAS. A, a, a good example here is the financial regulation. Uh, I'm talking about the revised edition of 2009. It's referred to as financial instructions in most states. Now, the document prescribed the manner and rates for depreciating tangible assets, just for example. And these methods are and rates are in direct contradiction with IPSA 17, property, plants, and equipment. Now, this dissonance, the, 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 the divergence between the provisions of the financial regulation or the financial instruction and the requirements of IPSA 17 cannot be stressed over and over again because the financial regulation is to the civil servant what the Bible is to Christians. It is to the civil servant what the Quran is to the Muslim. Guess what? In the civil service, examinations and promotion interviews are done are still based on the financial regulation. A document that does not acknowledge IPSAS and mostly in direct contradiction to IPSAS as relates to the component of financial reports. Yeah. Another similar authoritative law that obviously wrestles with a core basis. Your question is what are the structural hindrances? Yeah. Okay, 
another document that wrestles with Accra basis Ipsas is the Finance Control and Management Act of 1958, CAP 144 LFA. What is my point exactly? There are extant provisions of the law that requires revision if indeed the public sector is to achieve Accra basis Ipsas reporting mat maturity. Some In fact, some of us would have preferred that as part of the, the cleanups that the Finance Act of 2021 uh, uh, undertook just a while ago, we would have also taken a very quali qualitative look at the Finance Control and Management Act to address all the areas of contradiction between legacy, legacy laws and the requirement of the international public sector accounting standard. Until these structural hindrances are resolved, then we might still continue to struggle in the adoption of our particularly in the public sector, adoption of our basis success. Thank you very much. And um, Tunde Belo is called, asking us the issue of cost acquisition and customization can be challenged. Ooh. I the ERP is not the one. Okay, so Sunde Belu, th th thank you very much. You are absolutely correct that uh, the costs of acquisition, configuration, deployment, and even training of an ERP is a major factor. And to reinforce your persuasion or your sentiment, this is perhaps why many subnationals in Nigeria are yet to get their foothold on ERP. The answer is yes, but, but you know, it is however possible for some measure of synergy across or among states. So two, three, four, five states, indeed 36 states, can negotiate a bundle package across, and that reduces the cost per subnational, the cost per state. But do we even have a choice beyond the cost consideration? Do we have a choice other than to deploy an ERP? Otherwise, it will be difficult to generate an accurate basis financial statement using an, an automated tool. You will, as a government, will be reliant on Microsoft Excel. Maybe a point to emphasize again is, if the cost of acquisition, customization, deployment, training, and ongoing maintenance is a consideration, we can also look at local content. I know of many locally developed solutions that mirrors the functionality and the capability of a first world ERP, of an international ERP that will be built in Naira, not in dollars, that the training and everything local content. So if I'm a subnational, if I'm a state and I'm cost conscious, I will come, I will look indigenous. And then eventually, with configuration, maybe try and error at start, we will get there. Hmm. Fantastic. And uh, Mr. Mr. Bello's point uh, takes me to maybe a short assessment from you uh, how you rate the performance of the shares of government. I'm talking about the federal, state, and local, the state, specific state. And um, the federal capital territory making this success in Nigeria. Um, as we get it's just a that we get. Oh, okay. Th th thank you very much for that question. Um, in terms of financial reporting consciousness, I will say that the public sector financial reporting community has witnessed remarkable improvements compared with what we had prior to 2012, uh, when Ipsas was at best embryonic, um, when many states were publishing financial reports that will at best be described as perfunctory. So are we where we were in the not too distant past? The answer is no, clearly. But are we where we plan to be based on the original big roadmap? The answer is a categorically a categorical no. Now, given the peculiar nature of the type of federation we run in Nigeria, 
I think the federal government can do better in showing leadership with respect to the adoption of or adoption and continued compliance with adoption of and continued compliance with aqua basis IPSAS, including compliance with all the extant laws as they relate to the presentation and preparation of financial statements. Now, now, now for example, section 49 subsection 1 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So you, the question is, how have we fared here? Section 49 subsection 1 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act of uh, 2007 states that the federal government shall publish her financial reports and not later than six months of the year end, okay, and present it for audit, not later than six months. Now, the Accountant General of the Federation um, submitted the 2019 Consolidated Financial Statement of the federal government, okay? It was submitted around 25th of May, 2021, okay? So it was for 2013, the year ended 31st December 2013, publication was meant to have taken place at the very latest 30th June 2020. But it was presented for audit. This is not for publication. It was presented for audit on the 25th of May, 10 clear months behind schedule. So, I, I, and I'm not sure, that was 2019, we're in 2020. So I'm not sure the 2020 financial statement has been published, even as of today. 27th January 2022. So my, my point here is, it has implications. There are mm. silent statements that you are making. As a big brother, the implication is that many subnational state governments are likely being influenced by and taking cues from the big brother example of the federal government. So have we done? Well, we are not where we were. We are not where we intend to be. But the federal government needs to show more leadership in across basis in prompt rendition of financial reports. Always showing example is the way to go, and that is where we have leaders. For example, uh, for example, like here, any current inducement, if any, uh, to the adoption of and ongoing compliance with FIFA. Okay, so, so th 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 thank you very much. Unlike in the private sector, where we had enforcement. I, I, I like your choice of word, inducement, because perhaps there is very little uh, hammer-like enforcement that you can do in the public sector. Uh, so let, let's begin with where the first appearance of inducement, when it, when it happened in June 2016, the Kamiya Oshun led Federal Minister of Finance listed 23 conditions that states must meet to qualify for the 90 billion naira bailout fund if you remember mm -hmm. interestingly the adoption of ipsas and the acquisition of an ipsas compliant erp were part of those 23 conditions wow. but it turned out that um, th those conditions and the pronouncement of the condition in itself was mere political sound bites mm. because there was no way a state could meet those conditions within the very limited time frame for 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 which the the bailout was needed so that mm. was about six years ago um but in recent time the world bank came up with an initiative and this would interest everybody that that was christian or that is christian sifters sifter stands for states trans states financial transparency, accountability, and sustainability, and with generous rewards in millions of dollars, actually, for states that meet the specific DLIs. They call them disbursement-linked indicators. Part of the DLI is adoption of IPSAS. So what it means is a state that is compliant with IPSAS will likely meet one of the DLIs, and that will make the state eligible for some grants, foreign grants, now, these are the two instances of inducement that one can readily remember. However, the industry will really appreciate um, or really desire if the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria show some, some regulatory leadership 
in IPSAS enfor enforcement in the public sector, just like it did in the private sector between 2012 and 2014 for IPSAS. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And uh, maybe also coming back, uh, talking about local solutions, that uh, having a look at local solutions for the development of all IPSAS to be widely deployed and used. Okay, so Tunde Belu, I'm, I'm inspired by your active engagement. Um, my answer is a categorical yes. Um, the Nigerian software space or software industry or application development industry has actually evolved more than we have given it, uh, we have given it thanks or credit for. Uh, I know of many solutions at the ris risk of sounding um uh, or marketing specific products i know of about two three four products okay that are erp like did i say erp like that are erp in robustness in capability and in functionality interestingly i mean to that space as well i i i sell i deploy solution we have local content that can benchmark all of those foreign solutions and for which you don't even need to break a bank to, to develop. Um, to I hope that satisfies, that, that suffices. Well, in fact, it should suffice, really. Um, how do we say it? Uh, me start off. Thinking global, acting. Absolutely, global. Mr. Kimfatunke. Now, um, so, so I got to know from my interaction with the state accountant general, with a close friend, that one major conundrum with IPSAS adoption is the issue of identifying and measuring legacy assets and liabilities. What has been your experience in this regard? Oh, okay. So I'm very glad, Mr. Kimfatunke, that you asked the question. So if you can just give it three minutes, uh, because this is perhaps the most burning conversation in IPSAS deployment across the length and breadth of, of, of the public sector. Um, you, you, your question borders on legacy assets. Please confirm, sir. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So, so to our viewers, what are legacy assets? Because that sounds like an esoteric lexicon or a vocabulary. So, mm -hmm. legacy assets are pre adoption assets. I, in other words, assets that the states or the federal government or the public sector entity had built, acquired, constructed, okay, proud to the adoption of IPSAS. That's legacy assets, okay? Mm. Now, in answering your question, Mr. Takin okay, give, give me just two minutes to, to do justice to this. Um, let, let me share some statistics with you. Uh, the federal government total assets in its 2019 financial statement was two, was, was, was 8.154 trillion naira, mm. federal government total assets in 2019 financial statement, 8.154 trillion naira, up from 3.5 trillion naira the previous year. Now, now pause for a moment and listen to this. 8.154 trillion naira, representing the total asset of the federal government? Come on. That is pitifully low. Where are the federal government investments in power infrastructure? investment in water infrastructure, in road infrastructure, in bridges, and so on. Now, I have no way of knowing the facts, but I venture to conjecture that the federal government has not measured and recognized all our tangible assets. Now, now let's take, take a look at some of the subnationals, the state governments. On those states, not in any particular order, on those states, I mean, I became interested because this state claimed to have come or converted to acquire basis IPSAS. On those states reported the total asset of 288.4 billion naira in its 20 or in a 2019 annual financial statement. My verdict, legacy asset, perhaps have not been recognized. Taking Kano for, for an example, in its 2020 financial acquire basis IPSAS, the state reported a total asset of 246.3 billion naira for a whole state. My verdict, legacy asset, perhaps, have not been recognized. Now, let's come to the center of excellence, Lagos State. In its 2020 Accra basis IPSAS, the state reported a total asset of, of 
of 2.561 trillion naira. 2.561. Really? 2.561? Even looking at the millennium schools that, that are built across the state will suggest that this, the figure of 2.561 trillion naira is manifestly small for the center of excellence. We recognize again, I mean, we see these evidences everywhere, that the state is into some service concession arrangement from Lekito Gate and so on. These assets are meant to be recognized in the books of the Grand Paul based on Ipsas 32. Now, as I close on that, on that subject matter, now we must be objective in assess assessment. This is not castigating some of the states that have braved the hordes, or even the federal government that have braved the horde in transiting to Accra basis Ipsas. Uh, so the federal government and the two subnationals that I mentioned, you know, we must commend them for at least taking the giant stride to adopt Accra basis Ipsas even if there are gaps here and there. There are still many state governments that remain stuck with the conventional cash accounting practices. Please go online and check the financial statement, 2019 financial statement of Anambra State, of Abia State, of River State. These are all still based on the old method of preparing um, 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 statement of consolidated revenue fund capital development fund, statement of asset and liability. Can I quickly drop one thing for 10 seconds? Please, Mr. Kipatuke, how many times have you heard a state governor living at the end of his tenure, going to the press to announce how much he left in the quarters? How many times? I'm sure many times. They will mm -hmm. announce that they left 30 billion naira, 40 billion naira. What they won't announce to you is the amount of matured obligation that are also left and how those matured obligation compares with the amount of cash they left under the old reporting architecture i.e cash accounting that was what the, the the public sector was characterized with under the cash accounting you can indeed begin to or you can indeed stop payment of salaries for five months to the end of your tenure simply because you want to leave a robust treasury that was possible or that is still possible because these entities do not prepare cash basis reporting and that's why i was excited when i saw the use of ipsas for proper or effective governance for you to really claim that you are transparent and you advance the the, the principle of accountability all public sector entity must be on Accra basis Ipsas architecture. You can say that again and again and again. Some of those basic good tenets that the international accountants of Nigeria going up in our professional career has always asked us to do for our basis, correctness, accuracy, and in you know uh, integrity. In, in the numbers uh, that you prefer. You've been giving great insights, uh, Mr. Bolaji, also. And for those of our online viewers who are with us, those who are just joining us for close to about 30 minutes, now I have engaged Mr. Bolaji, who also FDA, on this instant subject of a core basis, which starts as a school of public government. I'll be looking at the Nigerian experience thus far, EU challenges and notable areas for improvement. We are going to go on a short break now. We are going to be back with you to continue to feel more and more questions to do, uh, Mr. Abolaji of course. Make sure you don't go away. We will be back with you very shortly.
and thank you for staying on. Welcome back to this very scintillating uh, subject. Now, Mr. Otto, you have always been this trade off between capital expenditure, current expenditure for this sector. And each successive administration tried to deploy more resources to capital expenditure and less to recurrent expenditure. Please tell us. Is it safe to conclude that all capital expenditure of government results in assets creation, example, property plants and equipment? Okay, um, Mr. Kifatuke, that, that's a very thoughtful question. Uh, actually, it can indeed be controversial, particularly among accountants. Now, you know, if you ask an average accountant out there what qualifies as capital expenditure and what qualifies as recurrent expenditure, they will likely unhesitantly respond in the manner of the nature and perhaps size of the expenditure so or the, the, the frequency. So they will tell you things like if, they, if an expenditure is for consumption, okay, or for services, then it will be recurrent, okay? If an expenditure is uh, for tangible asset, then it will be capital. In fact, some will even um, confidently claim that if it is small in amount, then it is recurrent. If it's big in amount, then it's capital. Those things don't hold water in the public sector. What determines, and I'm stressing this for effect, what determines whether an expenditure is capital or recurrent? is where the expenditure was featured in the budget. Mm. Mm. So I, I'll take it again. So if you, put a, if you put a salary expenditure in a capital budget, the moment it is spent, it's a capital expenditure. Mm. If you put a training budget in capital expenditure, if it is spent, it's capital expenditure. So capital are recurrent has nothing to do with the conventional accounting classification of assets and expenses. Far from it. Now, let me give you some insight in the public sector because we've been at this um, at this trade or at this game for, for almost six, seven years, practically for upward of 10, 12 years, theoretically. In the public sector, there was a program instituted by this administration called School Feeding Program. It has always been capital, and rightly so. In all the state governments, including federal government, refuse disposal is capital. Please find out. Immunization is capital. Please find out. And all these do not scholarship in many state government is capital. Why? It's a function of where at the risk of sounding repetitive, it's a function of where these expenditures were featured in the budget. So to answer your question, it is not safe to conclude that all capital expenditure results in creation of assets. As I close on this, maybe we should hang it. Others will ask questions that will give us opportunity to, to discuss for them. Beautiful insights, and then uh, one just uh, just came on now with uh, one of our past presidents. Uh, I know you mentioned a bit about that. We uh, think we are having a wonderful session. Thank you very much, Elijah Rajaka, Gary Ola. It's asking that if you can explain some implementation challenges of our world based system. Additional insights into that. Um, uh, Mr. President, um, I'm, I'm so inspired to uh, read from you and for your intervention, sir. There are a portfolio of issues, but if you ask me to prioritize them, I will say, number one, it is sponsorship at the highest level. I, I think the sponsorship can be better. I mean, at the level of the executives, uh, the president, the governor, the minister. Now, if we come to the operational challenges, number one on my list will be technical competence or the lack thereof. Because at the moment, the cognitive ability and sagacity of the 
of the handlers of the financial reporting uh, mm. process is still replete with a lot of gap. Why? Because, you know, it is easier learning new way of life mm. than on learning the old way. Today, in the public sector, if you talk about revenue from exchange and revenue, which is IPSAS 9, and revenue from non-exchange, it sounds a bit strange to many public sector practitioners. Why? Because for so long, what they are used to is IGR versus federal allocation. That is the split, not exchange, not non-exchange. Another major challenge, Mr. President, is the issue of foreign loan. I know I am on the information super highway, and I make bold to say that you can convert every item in the books of accounts of a public sector entity. You cannot convert their foreign loans to IPSAS. You hmm. cannot. You know why? Because to convert foreign loans to IPSAS, you must comply with IPSAS 41, Financial Instrument Recognition and Measurement, which hmm. presupposes that you, first of all, compute what we call effective interest rates. In other words, a rate that aggregates all the expenses of the borrower. And you mm -hmm. use the effective interest rates to develop amortization schedule. Now, if I've been technical in what I said, please forgive me. What I'm saying is for you to properly convert foreign loan from development partners, World Bank, IMF, African Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, for you to properly convert it to IPSAS, you need a repayment schedule. And that repayment schedule, I guarantee you, is like a moving train. Anyway, <laughs> I, for, 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 for lack of time, let me keep yeah. it at those two. Thank you very much. The little you have given to us is so short that it keeps us as members of the institute who want to seek for more. And uh, long enough for us to begin to now really reflect. Thank you very much, Mr. So, uh, I know this may sound a little technical. Uh, being an accountant myself, uh, I know that IFRS, in IFRS, there are five primary reports in the financial system, so, uh, namely, one, the statement of financial position to the balance sheet, two, the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. And three, uh, the statement of changes in equity. Four, statement of cash flows. And uh, five, notes to the account. However, in that, unlike IFRS, there are 64 for the statement of budget comparison with actual. Please, very briefly, help us to put some light on that fifth report and how it compares with statement number three. Um, earlier mentioned that in the statement of tax flow. Th th thank you very much. Uh, th th that question borders on IPSA, IPSAS 1, I think paragraph 21. Okay, so there's a there's a fifth report called Statement of Budget Comparison. Ideally, ideally, if Nigeria could do accrual budgeting, that fifth statement would not have been needed. The reason for it is because we do budgeting on cash basis, but reporting on accrual basis. And so there is no basis for comparing the budget, which is cash. And you know, why is this important? Uh, Mr. Akinfatunke, in yeah. the private sector, a, an entity is said to have grown by comparing its results, its current results, with previous year's results. That's how you determine the, if the entity has grown. Mm. So it's comparative with prior, with prior year's reports. Mm. But in the public sector, you don't do historical comparison to establishing growth, not, not at all. You compare the current report with the budget. In any case, even the budget has the force of law. That's why it's called appropriation act so the budget is on cash and the actual is on accrual because of the dissonance in the basis ipsas 24 paragraph 23 and even 41 says you will prepare a separate report 
that will be on the basis of cash. In other words, that will be on the basis of the budget was what I wanted to say. So what it means is after preparing your aqua report, you will now prepare your report again in cash so that you can compare it with the budget. Okay. Mm. And that's your question. The eventual result of that fifth report, which is called statement of budget comparison, must be reconciled with statement of cash flow so that the net effect of that fifth report must be exactly equal to the net movement in cash and cash equivalent in the statement of cash flow. Mr. Kepatuke. Fantastic. Thank you very, very, very much. And uh, because time will always be um, a limiting factor on this subject of a basic test. Do we have your last word? Okay. Um, my parting remarks, um, I, I, I think I will need to, first of all, say thank you to Madam President for our vision, for our initiative, for, for our energy. This clearly is one of them. Um, I never thought this would happen at about now when everybody is moving his business to the information super highway. So Madam President, in case you are listening to me, we are inspired. I've spoken with a number of accountants who have been touched by this initiative. I hope there are governance structure for sustainability of this initiative. We will not want it to die. Okay, so Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Akin Fatuke, I'll come to you. If you are an accountant listening to me, I've got breaking news for you. Do you know that all the conversation that we've had thus far centers on the federal government and the state governments? The local government, 774 of them, have not lifted a finger. Hmm. 774 of them. Are you beginning to imagine the opportunity that our uh, embryonic in IPSAS consulting, advisory services, and training? Now, what's my point? Please step up your game. Acquire the needed skills. Don't just limit yourself to theories. Get a mentor if you must because the opportunities are stupendous. I mean, we live in witness. Now, to um, okay, to, to, to the political office holders, if you are listening to me, particularly those with executive powers who have influences on the financial reporting value chain, please remember that in contemporary times, we're in 2022, the hallmark in the public sector is about accountability, is about transparency. Accountability is the liability to be held responsible for the exercise of authority and for the deployment of resources, what better way to demonstrate accountability for public resources than by implementing, adopting, and continued compliance with Accra basics? Remember what governors do. They go to the press to announce all the, but they don't announce their matured obligation. So mm. if you are listening to me and you are a political office holder, please, I hold you in the strongest possible terms. Please prioritize it Accra basis IPSAS adoption. Posterity will judge you rightly and the is and history will be on your side. Mr. Akifatunke, you have inspired me. Your modus operandi, the mechanism, the maturity with which you attend to question, and your time management. I could go on and on. I I am I, I am still talking because I want to stand up for you. I doff my heart for you. Please continue to self-renew your strength because many have been touched by your efforts many have been touched by your efforts and you are making the nigerian accountant to be a global player mr kifatuke please keep up the good work thank you very much and go to my editorial team who are working behind the scene um thank you very much mr Otto. we really appreciate you and this initiative is a continuous one we are here to do that so this um, every week. Our next episode will be Tuesday, February 1, 2022, 6 p.m. And it will be online. Please, our listeners, make sure you tell somebody to join you. And we're going to be looking at this topic surviving as a female corporate leader in a male dominated board. Uh, our guest will be Mrs. Omolara Fagbure, FCA. She's CEO of Omol Lion, a Fagbure and Associates Unlimited. A cognate professional in business services 
comprising corporate governance, enterprise, and company secular practices. Is an affiliate member of ICSA, the Chartered Governance Institute of London and UK. Please tell somebody that you do not want to miss this. I leave you with this quotation. What governance needs is discipline. Only discipline within can ensure discipline without. And that has been given by Narendra Modi. Times of India. A big change you would like to see, and until we come your way, Tuesday, February 1, 2022, I remain at it. I don't care. Your anchor, I cannot air. Bye for now.